going to be another exciting panel. And whilst we watch their video, I'd please like to ask my next panellist to come onto the stage and the video will introduce them. <laughs> Electrification of transport systems changes the material requirements for our vehicles. The use of batteries, fuel cells and traction motors requires a range of minor metals, many of them often deemed critical. At Altilium, our mission is to give the UK energy security by supplying high volumes of domestic, low carbon, sustainable battery raw materials from recycling battery scrap, off-spec batteries, end of life batteries and mine tailings for direct use into the UK automotive supply chain. The UK is the birthplace of the lithium ion battery cell and we have a huge opportunity to be a leader in next generation sustainable battery technologies like sodium ions. We've heard a lot today from Alison, from David in his uh, keynote about, from Nissan as well, about refabricating how important it is to make new stuff, to recycle, to make this sort of whole circle complete, I guess, Evie. So if we can just sort of start with you, because I think we're all concerned here about the, well, the fact that the critical raw materials are not going to, they're not going to last forever. Is this a real concern? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I have to thank the previous panel because I think they've done a fantastic um, introduction to raw materials in general. But I, I would just like to emphasize that the unprecedented growth we see in the electrification of transport systems actually equates to uh, understanding growth in materials demand, especially so for critical raw materials. And unfortunately, in the UK, we're not producing many of them. There are some projects, as we heard, for about corn, lithium, etc., where they are trying to scale up production, but not yet. Um, I think the other thing we have to um, be aware of is that if you think the timeline of bringing uh, new EVs to stream is long, well, then double this for bringing new material supply to stream. You know, we're talking about an average of 15, 20 years to bring new materials to stream. So, and the time is very tight, as I said, we've heard about the time scale a lot this morning. Um, so that's something we need to take into account. The other thing that we really need to take into account is that we are not in that on our own. The whole world is trying to go down the same route. They're all competing for the same materials that they're produced from limited countries, many of them monopolized supply chains, etc. So there are a lot of issues around that. Many countries, they've also come in, in terms of, as a, as a way of securing supply, they have introduced new policy, new regulations. We've heard about the ERA, who, uh, the, the European Raw Materials Act is another instrument that's going to influence massively what's happened around critical raw material supply chains. In the UK, we've got a UK critical mineral strategy as well. And all of them, although they're trying to um, improve and diversify supply of critical materials at the same time, they also create some sort of bottlenecks, especially with regards maybe to import and trade restrictions, etc. We've seen this happening. And finally, that's going to be my final <laughs> comment for this question is that um, we're not when we talk about sustainability, we shouldn't think about sustainability just from the point of our transport systems. Sustainability should be an element that takes place across the whole value chain, and mm. that's the case also for raw materials, okay? And this is not very tricky. It's very tricky because, in principle, mining is not sustainable. So we need to make sure that supply is responsible, but to do that is, is, is quite a difficult thing to achieve. So I'll leave it to that and hopefully I'll catch up on that later. I think we will. But John, let me turn to you now because obviously your whole business is the recycling of batteries. So how big are the challenges now? I mean, it, it, let's take a real kind of, you know, top down, a bird's eye view of this at the moment. Okay, so uh, I mean, I, I have like the, the dual background of mining and, and uh, now uh, battery recycling and, and, and cathode active material production at uh, um, Altilium Clean Technology. I mean, everything that uh, Evie said about um, primary raw material development is correct. You know, these things take a lot of time to bring on stream. Um, we are going to be living in a critical mineral deficient world for at least 10 years, if not longer, which means you have to have a really strong focus on recycling um, wherever you can do it. Now, 
in the recycling world, most people get drawn to the, to the kind of end of life batteries, but realistically speaking, battery scrap, off spec batteries, damaged batteries, all of these things are gonna be available from the very beginning of the industry and are, are in fact available now. Um, roughly speaking, you know, typically 10 to 15% scrap is not unusual in the industry, especially in the, in the high nickel chemistries. Um, so it, there's a big opportunity there to supplement the, the primary raw materials with, um, with recycled raw materials. Obviously, from a, from a legislative perspective, the EU um, is, and the UK are putting in place minimum recycled content for batteries. So that it also is a challenge for, um, you know, for the industry itself. Um, so, I mean, from, from, uh, from that perspective, um, you know, le legislation is also quite important to us as, a, as an industry. We talked a lot today about understanding what the future holds in terms of legislation. So it's not necessarily the legislation itself, it's the uncertainty that we face that's the big challenge you know, for us right now, that, uh, you know, what is going to be said in the budget in, 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 a, in a couple of months' time as well. Um, incentives for the industry, you know, you heard the, the previous uh, panel talking about, or Julian was mentioning the gap between innovation and then project execution. And in the center, there's this gaping hole in terms of, of funding. So it's really, really important that we find a way of plugging that hole and actually have an end-to-end um, finance solution for all of the projects in these, uh, in, in these battery chains. So, and then I think finally, the, the big thing I, I would say for the automotive industry in the UK uh, from a um, supply chain perspective has just been the, the, the big lack of cathode active material manufacturing capacity, which is something that Altinium are looking to bring to the UK also. If I could turn to you, uh, Eugene, now, the question which we were sort of posing to start this discussion off is, you know, are the concerns about raw material supply justified? Now, a lot of that assumes that we know what that supply is, and that's where your specialism comes into play, <coughs> isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> yes, the concerns are there. Um, and there is, as everyone knows, increasing number of uh, legislations, regulations that's coming up. Um, and they are requiring more traceability, not less. Needing to know where critical minerals come from, where certain products are produced, not just from your immediate supplier, but all the way back to the mine. So the clock has already started ticking on, on that. Um, and how this then links to circularity is that Circular, circularity depends on having all this reliable, verifiable information about re what is recyclable, what's gone into the product, how it's been used, and, and what to actually do with it. Um, and if you think of it, you know, what's going to be potentially recycled today would have started that journey 10, 12 years ago if it was um, an NEV battery. Um, similarly with, with, with scrap as well. So I think the OEMs and, and the supply chains need to work differently to be able to enable this uh, information to be collected, to be shared, to be updated, to be maintained, and, and also for it to be verifiable in order to drive the potential that circularity offers us as a, as a planet. Yeah. Let's get your opinion, Fergal, just as we sort of kick off this discussion. Um, from your position as somebody who's making batteries and designing batteries, wanting them to be more recyclable, is that driven by a concern that you're not going to be able to get your hands on the, on the, on the materials? I wouldn't quite say it's driven by it, but it's certainly sort of a factor in, a, in consideration. Mm. So one of our key battery cell products is a sodium ion battery cell. So that is similar in how it operates to a lithium ion battery, in particular a LFP battery cell, but one of the main appeals uh, from our potential customers, both in the energy storage and electric vehicle markets, are the, the fact that it doesn't use any lithium at all. So we actually see customers coming to us with concerns about 
at uh, what's upstream, well upstream from them, concerns you might think only we would have, whereas they're already looking at the geopolitical landscape and at the, and at the raw material supply chain and thinking, how do we diversify our product range so we're not entirely dependent on a lithium supply and sort of refining chain that at the moment is very sort of, yeah, is a potential bottleneck should, should, should things change. So you're providing different alternatives, but and I mean, I suppose the next question then for all of you is, how do you create a better environment for your businesses to flourish? <laughs> what, what needs to change? I mean, Fergal, let's keep going with, with, with your company. What, what would help you? So I think Julian touched on it in the previous panel, I think where particularly companies like, like Amti, where we are always looking for more support is in that scale up phase, going from SME and uh, doing really well from things like Innovate UK funding, Bayes funding, APC funding, they're all really fantastic schemes. But where there is that gap in funding at the moment is where there's huge capex investment required, huge um, th sort of equipment that needs to be built and there's long lead times until sort of sales are actually delivered. There's a very sort of heavy amount of investment required. And I think we're certainly in a situation where more support could be provided towards that rather than sort of relying on the market to solve itself, especially when you look at globally, look at what the IRA has done in the US, what China are doing with their companies, the amount of support they're providing them. We're certainly not matching that in the UK at the moment, and that would that would help us. And then it also gives us the freedom to research more and push more towards um, a circular economy, because then it's not reliant purely on a business need. I mean, Evie, if you had to lay down what you felt was necessary to make sure the entire electric vehicle value chain was sustainable, you know, if you had a blank sheet of paper, what, what would be on it? What, how, how can we make this work well? Well, I, I think I would go a step back and say, how well do I understand my supply chain at the moment? And I think, unfortunately, because the current supply chains are global, they're very complex, they include multiple players, and we haven't had to account for anything like material flows across whole value chains before. We have very little knowledge about where the bottlenecks, the pinch points exist at the moment, and where the opportunities potentially arise. So I think it's really, really important that we start by mapping the supply chains, trying to understand how materials flows across different economies and different continents possibly, and then to see what sort of opportunities arise, both for the UK, but also the global market as well. And this is very tricky, it's not trivial. It's very tricky because our reporting systems at the moment, all the statistics we collect, whether these are on monetary basis or at, at physical, you know, mass basis, they are not built up to do this sort of job. So if you want to build up this sort of very complex maps, you, you have to spend a lot of time trying to assess a lot of dispersed data from a variety of different sources to pull them together to, you know, create your puzzle. Mm. I think as well, I mean, if, you're, if you want a very circular, sustainable economy, you've got to make it easy to recycle batteries. And there's a number of things you can do in order to help this. So firstly, you know, in the design stage of the battery, design them to make them recyclable, uh, you know, with, with um, uh, least difficulty as possible. I mean, this could be basic things like, you know, standardizing fastenings. You know, the, the disassembly part of a battery recycling process is very, very manual. You don't want to have to have 20 different versions of, uh, you know, a fastening across across Europe. You you want maybe a few, but not not that many. Um, so any degree of standardization that's it, that's in there is going to help, especially with things like connectors, because everyone's going to discharge the battery before you recycle it. So you want to make it as easy as possible to discharge. And then when it comes to um, you know, the raw materials, etc., that you're using to manufacture these batteries, having some un understanding of what, you know, what is the specification of lithium hydroxide across the UK and the EU. Mm. You know, th things like that are really important because if we have um, 10 different versions, then of course you just end up with a very complex process. So making things as simple as possible, starting with a design phase to make it easy to recycle, 
and then as much standardization as you go through is, is, is really important. I mean, how, how close are we to that? I mean, is there an appetite for that? Are you finding that people are beginning to think in those ways? I think people are starting to understand it's, it's necessary. It tends not to happen at the beginning, especially with a, the with a nascent in industry, right? Mm. Because there's a lot of innovation going on. People haven't settled yet on their technical roadmaps. Mm. So th there are different discussions around, is it NMC, is it LFP, is it solid state? you know, et cetera, there's, there's lots of different technologies there. I would just say that, you know, automotive is, is um, you know, nothing changes particularly fast. Usually once, it, once something's in, it's uh, specified for at least five years. You know, so there are opportunities to, uh, to, to, to do these sorts of things now and to try and say, well, look, this is a suite of the basic tools. We don't want to inhibit your innovation, but if you want to recycle at the end as cheaply and simply as possible, standardization is a big component of that. I think also maximizing sort of self first life. So I think sometimes there's a tendency to talk automatically from first life straight to recycling or straight into waste, but there's actually quite an opportunity with battery cells to put them into second life applications. So in the UK, Nissan have already done a great job with that, say, taking their cells and putting them into energy storage units. But at the moment, there's no real sort of standard process or framework for doing that. It's very much done sort of on an OEM by OEM or energy storage manufacturer basis. So I think more of a framework there would certainly help things. And then on the cell manufacturer side, we're just trying to maximize the durability of our cells. So sodium is a more thermally stable chemistry. So that means in its first life, it's less exposed to sort of environmental damage, which then means they actually last longer in a second life as well. So that is enabling circularity from the point of view of, of cell design. I'd say in terms of standardizing cell design, I think it's more likely to happen at the module level. So maybe having then a module standard that people could build business models around, which then says taking a module out of a car and then putting it into that energy storage unit, for example, would be a way of going about that. I think at the cell level, it's a bit more difficult just because of how much a massive range of requirements there are for battery cells and having sort of one that fits all is quite, it's quite a challenge. Yeah. I think John, John brought up a very <clears throat> salient point earlier about um, designing circularity into the product itself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'm sure we've heard that, but um, the real challenge is, is what does that actually mean? Um, and it's, it's the challenge of designing something into the product, you know, and also being able to collect the information along the way to actually test if that's the case in two, three, five, ten years time as well. But I think that's, that's very necessary. And, and, and with the customers that we've been working with, while looking at circularity, um, a lot of what, what, so most of our customers sit outside of the UK um, because they are also driven by the legislation in the EU, legislation with the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. Um, and, and that's making them think very, very hard about what they need to actually do in order to enable that traceability and the circularity that comes with it. It's forcing them to actually have to work within their organizations across functions that typically did not um, you know, collaborate in, the, in that seamless way. So I think there's also an organizational challenge. Um, part of that then would be you know, culturally how we harness that energy and the innovation within the organization. And then to actually work not just in the upstream supply chain, we talked a lot about critical minerals, but also about what happens to the product after it's been made. What happens to it in life? And what's been driving a lot of <clears throat> what we are seeing? So we started our business five years ago, and, um, and customers used our traceability service because it was a good thing to do. We want to demonstrate that we're, respons we're sourcing responsibly. That conversation has changed in the last year to 18 months because of all the regulations that have come up. Now I need to prove that this is actually the case. Now there is a regulation that requires this. So, I mean, I hate to say it, but regulation plays a very strong part 
in incentivizing businesses to actually start thinking about it because um, we don't have enough time. Mm. Like I said, the clock's already tick. It's, it's really ticking away. So, so I, don't think, I don't think regulation is the answer. I think it's part of a suite of things that need to happen. So just for the manufacturers in the room, um, exactly what kind of things are your clients now mapping and noting and becoming accountable for? Yeah, so we work so in the, in the automotive space. Um, we've, we've got uh, quite a few customers. Um, we're able to work with them to trace for every single EV battery that comes out, um, the critical minerals, nickel, lithium, um, you know, what goes into the cathode, what goes into the anode, um, where, which mine it comes from every battery to each battery pack, to each module, to each cell, the um, chemical components that have gone into it, where it's been refined, where it's been processed, which mine it came from, to be able to have that full end-to-end -end digital supply chain. And then what happens to it in life? How is it being used? What's the state of health? How has it been, been recharged? Um, in order to drive data, to kind of drive informed, this, um, kind of in, informed decisions at the end of life. Should I repurpose this? Should I actually recycle it? Is it easier to recycle, less, less carbon intensive to recycle it or actually to repurpose it based on its use and, and what's coming to it? I mean, John, and, would this sort of information be useful for your business? Is that, John, sorry, John, is that, sorry. is that the kind of information that you would find useful? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, mainly for our customers, it would be useful for our customers. Right. So okay. we're, we're kind of the, uh, you know, the conduit between you know, the, the, the data that um, Eugene would have, and his organization would have collected, and then ultimately what the OEMs uh, want. Right? right. I mean, if they, they want recycled content, but they, don't, they want to know where that recycled content's come from. That's and I think that's the critical yeah. kind of element from, uh, fr from our side. Typically, recycled raw materials, rule of thumb, you've got, uh, you know, about 30% of the carbon footprint of primary materials. So, you know, mm. from a carbon border adjustment mechanism perspective as well and understanding your embedded carbon footprint, you know, knowing these things, I think is going to become increasingly important as, uh, as, as we move forward with the industry. Well, I mean, Evie, from what you were saying, this is the kind of reporting that you would yeah. like across the board, right? Yeah, I think so. And, and I mean, what Eugene is talking about is what we often call about battery passports, right? Mm -hmm. This is going to become a really huge thing and very important thing in the circular economy world. You know, you have to know what materials you've got in your products, you know, where they've come from, etc., so that you know how you can utilize them properly at the end of life. Mm. And, and that's at the moment something good to have, but we know that it's going to become um, a, a reality very, very soon. So um, it's very important for all businesses to start working to that sort of reality. And it's going to be important here as well. You think it's going to be required? Um, it's, it's going to be, and yes. I think I think there is already quite a lot of move and discussion within the government, um, trying to see how the UK is going to respond to product passports and what sort of regulations they're going to put in place. So the UK has also a framework to develop this sort of, of tools and information. Um, at the moment, a lot of this discussion is driven from Europe, and obviously with the UK being a massive um, exporter of automotive systems to Europe, we have to comply with that. Um, so there will have to be some alignment between what the UK produces a product passport to what possibly EU is requiring. But um, I think it's also an opportunity for the UK to create a system that fits better our own needs. Mm. I think so, so, much, so much of the um, UK um, automotive production is exported. You know, you, you have to be able to comply with the, with the legislation in the EU. I think, I think last year we exported something like 600,000 vehicles, something of that order of magnitude. Mm. Someone will probably correct me uh, with, that, with that number, but I think <coughs> it was around that. You know, so it's quite, uh, you know, it's a big proportion of what we produce in the UK. So even though we're no longer part of, uh, of the EU post-Brexit, we've still got to be able to demonstrate that we can comply with legislation for the export market. And it also depends on which market you're exporting to. Mm -hmm. The, you know, regulations have a slightly different focus as well. So, you know, um, India as an example is very much focused on the extended producer responsibility. 
what happens to it in life, recycling around that. Uh, whereas the, the, you know, the, the US Inflation Reduction Act is very much focused on where the raw materials have come from and who's actually processed it. The EU is taking a more holistic view as well. So including you know, carbon footprint, uh, sustainability information, et cetera, not just at the uh, production of the, the vehicle or, or the battery, but also in life as well. So, so I mean, for, 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 for UK industry, that's, that's, that's quite a bit to get your head around and also to, to navigate. And, and I would urge everyone to you know, start now because you know, you're not going to get the time back. I think it's a potential competitive advantage for the UK as well. So we know we have relatively high labour costs and high land costs, but when battery cells start to compete more on the CO2 content, so when I think it's not a matter of if we're electrifying now, it's when sort of across the board. So that means you can then start to try and find differentiators. And I think one thing in the UK could be a sort of a generally greener battery cell production. So battery cells that use a higher mm. content of recycled materials. And we know from both the energy storage and electric vehicle firms we speak to, that's already a focus for them. So it's less about whether the battery cells are working their vehicle, it's how sustainable can we make that battery pack. And if potentially we're making greener cells in the UK, then that's a way for us to compete with yeah. the larger players offshore yeah and it's it's so much cheaper to embed sustainability into your process at the beginning than to actually build something and then modify it mm. so you know as as, as eugene says just, just start now i mean it does sound as if on this stage for sure there's a, a great cultural will for sustainability in the circular economy to be embedded early and that there could be competitive advantage for that as well Clearly, there are going to be challenges. I mean, every what do you think the biggest challenges are for people to for, for companies to sort of really embed this culture of sustainability? I'm, I'm going to go back to something that I said at the beginning. But as I said, sustainability is not something that would happen just in one stage of the of the supply chain. You have to think about sustainability across the whole value chain. And trying to come up with something that is holistic is very very tricky especially when you rely about um, on raw materials that they come from a variety of different sources that are beyond your control. Um, in terms of the circular economy, there are so many things that we really need to start building up um, to ensure that you know, they're an inherent part of what we're doing and the supply chains we're developing. Um, capacity building, regulations, investment are very, very important thing and are things that we have to start developing now. Um, we can't wait until the end of life products are available to recycle. We have to put this capacity, this money, build up the technology now so that we're sure that it's there for us to utilize and also to give us the opportunity to develop the economies of scale. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about secondary materials or primary materials. In any case, you need to build up economies of scales to be economically viable and to operate properly. Mm. There's lots of nodding. I mean, Eugene, <laughs> you obviously have successfully convinced people to take your accounting uh, methods and, and software on board. But I mean, how willing are people, yeah. do you feel? I, I think it's, it's less the solution, um, you know, giving them the answer to that. It's actually the organization, organizations that want to implement this that the technology then enables and helps them to underpin, you know, where, what is happening, the data that's coming from that. Um, I think there is a growing um, awareness, there's a growing willingness, but I think that the key thing for organizations is they, you know, it's just a complexity of where do I start? How do I start? It's too big, it's too complex. Um, and, and we always urge customers, you know, just pick one, something, and then start from there, and then grow as an organization, because um, it requires changes within the organization and how people think. It also requires how 
it also requires organizations to work and engage with their supply chain, both upstream and downstream in a slightly different way as well. Um, these things take time because these are long embedded ways of working, like John said, in the automotive industry, it's fixed for five years and et cetera. But so, so I think it's about just starting, making that first step in the journey and, and, and learning from it. And I'm gonna, you've given me a great idea now. What would the first step of the journey be for all of you? Where would you start, Fergal? If you were encouraging a company to sort of really take sustainability in the circular economy seriously? I think it's what Eugene said about the simplicity of messaging, because a lot of the time you might be talking to an engineer or someone so lower down in the company, but the decision is really being made at a C-suite level. And I think sometimes that's forgotten. It's really sort of top-down changes required. So you need a buy-in all the way through. So for us, it's that simplicity of messaging around sodium and the fact that is, for example, it's lower CO2, it doesn't have anywhere near as in energy intensive uh, sort of process to get hold of it as, as lithium does. That can just be a key sort of bite size message that someone can understand. And it doesn't have to be that for sodium, it could be that mm -hmm. about greener, other greener cathode materials, for example. And then you can start to make change. Whereas I think if you present the problem as being too large, it's almost over facing and then people don't do anything that they just take the decision, well, it can't be helped. I'll just go with the cheapest material. Whereas if you can sell the benefits of greener, greener materials and ways of working, then that is a way to implement change, but definitely one step at a time. Yeah. John, what, how about you? I think from, from my perspective, I mean, um, sustainability and the concepts around the circular economy are, are very much now like safety was in the 1970s. I mean, DuPont decided in the 1970s that safety, the d decision to do things safely or not was irrelevant. It was just that you had to do it safely. And I think we're there now with sustainability and the circular economy. There is no choice anymore. If you want your business to survive long term, the decision has already been made for you. You need to stop fighting against it. You just need to go do it. And that's it. And Evie, where would you start? I, I think I would agree with you. I think that's, that's very true. But I would say map your supply chain. Just understand who you connect with, um, where your reliance is, in, where your bottlenecks are and then take it a step further and see what sort of opportunity you can create out of these challenges. I think that would really help. Um, we're in a situation, especially in the UK, where we're almost trying to retrofit an industry that's been built to do something completely different. And that's always very hard when you talk about the circular economy. It's much easier when you start from scratch, building a business model that is circular from the beginning, and then you take it from there rather than having a linear model and then trying to turn it circular as you go along. It's very challenging. It's really challenging, but it, it, it can happen. You just need to start step by step from things that you know they can make a difference and then move forward. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, questions from the floor, please, for the panel. Do we have any about uh, challenges maybe your company's faced or? Yes, there's a hand up right at the front here in the second row. If you could say who you are, that would be wonderful. Richard Amadegama from uh, Mikos Technologies. Um, my question is, um, lithium seems to be the go-to metal at the moment. So there's a lot of investment in that with kind of 20, 25 year payback periods. Is there a danger that the focus on the supply chain around that material will crowd out new technologies, uh, a new chemistry such as sodium or whatever comes next because so much has been invested in it. Who'd like to say that one on? Well, I mean, I, I'm John, yeah. happy to talk a little bit about lithium. So, I mean, I, I've been fortunate to work on, on a lot of lithium projects around the world. Um, you know, when you look at the periodic table, there's not many things. Uh, that have um, lithiums, uh, well, there are none, <laughs> that have lith lithiums, uh, um, both lightweight characteristics and, 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 and ability as a, as, a, as a charge carrier in a battery. You know, so it's lots of um, um, investment has gone into this technology for exactly that reason. There's a lot of lithium um, um, on the planet. It's just, it, it's in lots of different minerals. You know, it's mica, it's uh, spodumene, it's brines, it's 
lithium from clays, etc. Um, it's just a matter of getting these projects off the ground. It doesn't mean that other technologies like sodium and vanadium and hydrogen don't have their place in the industry. They do, absolutely. You know, it's just, a, you know, it, it's really horses for courses, I would say here. I mean, there, there are, there are, uh, there is enough space in this sector and, and functionality requirements for all of these technologies to work. So I think lithium will, will, is destined to be the dominant technology going forwards. I don't think it's going to be the only technology. Um, I, you know, I, I definitely see, uh, you know, vanadium redox batteries and, uh, you know, what Bergel and the guys are doing with sodium and, at, uh, at Ampti, absolutely there. We talked earlier about hydrogen fuel cells for trucks and large pieces of mobile plant that have quite different um, uh, economic values to perhaps a personal electric vehicle, right? So all of these technologies, you know, are, are, are going to flourish. And it's um, ultimately, I think, mainstream in personal electric vehicles is, is going to be lithium-based technologies for at least 10 years. Now, that might then move towards solid state or another mm. technology which doesn't necessarily have the same quantity of lithium in it. But, um, you know, that that's, should be how the industry develops. I mean, Fergal, to your point earlier, people coming to you saying we'd actually like to diversify away from just one yeah, kind. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I think the investment in lithium today is actually, I think that the revenue, especially the big increase in investment in R&D, has actually supported the development of other technologies rather than sort of got in the way in the way of it, especially in our experience. It's our engagement with both lithium and sodium technologies historically that's allowed us to get to where we are today and being able to talk about a gigafactory making only sodium ion cells. I mean, that is, I mean, to even two, three years ago, that might not have been something sort of businesses thought was even possible because of this sort of billions and billions of pounds of investment in the industry. It's now scaled things up enough to sort of make that, make that a potential reality. So I think it's been a sort of a blessing rather than a curse in that sense. Well, listen, thank you for that question. We have, I'm not going to lie, miraculously come to zero, 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 zero on the clock. So that was perfect, perfect timing. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please give my panel a big round of applause. Thank you so much.